God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I beg your pardon for my sins and grace to make this time of prayer fruitful. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my guardian angel, intercede for me. We are here in the octave of the resurrection, which is uh, in the same order as the original encounter with Jesus Christ by, the, by John the Baptist, by the, his disciples, by John and Andrew, who, and let's go to the Gospels, on this, who say, it says, St. John's Gospel says, again the next day John was standing there and two of his disciples and looking upon Jesus as he walked by, he said, behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples heard him speak and they followed Jesus. But Jesus turned round and seeing them following him, said to them, What is it you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is interpreted master, where do you live? And he said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day. It was about the tenth hour, about four o'clock in the afternoon. And so the, the least that can be said here is that something happened that the, the, the lives of John and Andrew were changed and uh, Andrew went and so, so shaken, so affected, uh, so impressed that he goes off to get his brother Simon, and uh, Simon who becomes Peter, and brings him to Jesus. And Simon eventually goes and gets Philip. And so the, the whole thing begins, the drum beat starts, and it begins not with a, uh, an intellectual conclusion, it's not an idea, uh, it is an encounter with the living person of Jesus Christ. And the uh, St. Jose Maria, uh, in speaking about the resurrection and about, uh, I could refer to Giosani also, who is most interesting, but uh, St. Jose Maria, our father, talks about it says in Christ is passing by, Christ lives, which Pope Francis says is the kerygma, it's the original preaching, it's the word that has to be given out, it's the word that has to be spoken. And as it was spoken uh, 2,000 years ago, it has to be spoken again. And St. Josemaria says, Christ is alive. Uh, he's talking about the resurrection here, but he says, this is the great truth which fills our faith with meaning. Now, the, th the thing is, the, the, as I was thinking this out, the, the, uh, you know, the question is, why, why is, what is the root of this experience? Why, this, why is it an experience to come across Jesus Christ, to stay with him, to listen to him, and to look upon him, and we'll see after the resurrection to feel him, to touch him, to uh, be with him. The, the grounding of that experience has, has to be the fact that Jesus Christ is the, the image of the living God. 
In fact, he is God himself. So much image. And St. Paul, doing the theology of that experience, says he is the, in Colossians 1.15, he says he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for in him were created all things in the heavens and on the earth, things visible and invisible. In him all things were created. So, the, I mean, notice, something has to happen here because uh, these boys, John and uh, Andrew, and uh, all, all, John the Baptist, all, and us, uh, are created in the image and likeness of God. And here we are dealing with the incarnate living uh, and living image and likeness. I mean, we're dealing with not just, uh, we're dealing with the prototype. He's, uh, St. Paul says, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for in him were created all things. For it has pleased God the Father that in him all his fullness should dwell. So God the Father, the creator, the Father of Jesus Christ is present and uh, is there to behold and there to listen to and there to uh, permit to enter into us. And therefore something happens. There's an experience that goes on in you. Um, and then years later, St. Jose Maria will say, for years, I found my love for God was enkindled by considering Jesus' zeal to set the world ablaze with his fire. I couldn't contain the irrepressible ardor that welled up within me, making me cry out with the very words of the Master, Ignum beni mitre in terram et quid de volonisi uraccendatur. I have come to bring fire to the earth, and what will I but that it be kindled? And ecce eio guia bocasti me, here I am because you called me. I have come to set fire to the earth, and what will I but that it be kindled? And St. Jose Maria said, in the course of your life, how many of your friends' hearts you can set ablaze? Aren't you saddened? to see so many restless young people around you searching vainly for an ideal. Shout to them, fools, I leave those petty things that shrink the heart and very often degrade it. Leave all that and come with us after love. But love here is spelled with a capital L because it's the agape. It is the love that is present between the Father and the Son is the love of the Son for the Father and the Father for the Son and the Spirit is that love. And here it's before their very eyes and here it is in the life of St. Jose Maria who said yes to it. Our Lady said yes to it. She said, let it be done to me according to your word. And then I, I you know, just St. Jose Maria in speaking to us in the work, he said it would be very comfortable to remain isolated in a house of Opus Dei and of the work, thinking only about the things of God, but that would be to betray the work and what God wants of us, since for us the things of God are the things of the world which we have to raise to the supernatural order. What is the supernatural order? Is that spiritual? Is that immaterial? Or is it the order of Jesus Christ made flesh that we will see in Luke 24, feel me and see, the risen Christ says, feel me and see that flesh and bones don't have, a sp that I'm sorry, a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see, I have, feel me and see. And so they felt and they saw and they went out and they burned and they, the, the world was changed and you and I are here now and we're able to believe now because, because of this encounter with the person of Jesus Christ. And this Pope, Pope Francis, uh, just before he was, he was elected Pope by the Cardinals in the consistory, they, he was asked as, as all the candidates were to say a few words less than 10 minutes, but uh, significantly he said, the church is called to come out of herself to go to the peripheries, geographical, 
not merely geographic, but also existential. When the church does not come out of herself, when each one of us does not come out of self, when each one of us is into self, we get sick. He says we become self-referential and then get sick. So the original experience of Jesus Christ, um, it's... Um, so interesting to come across a figure like um, Luigi Giussani who says, I remember once on the staircase of the seminary in Milan while we were going down to chapel in silence, Manfredini, who became the cardinal of, of Milan, Manfredini said to me, just think, God became a man like us. He he stopped short, and the phrase struck me that God became a man like us is something out of this world. And I added, it's something out of this world that lives in this world. And as a result, this world becomes different, more bearable. It becomes more beautiful. What followed immediately from a passion for Christ as we were burning up the ground on which it flowered was passion for men, passion for their destiny, passion for the meaning of life, passion. Uh, can I use the word enthusiasm, where Pope Francis explains that enthusiasm comes from the Greek, and to you, uh, in God. And uh, he, he went on, not in tears, but almost, who knows what will become of these youngsters who come to the par et cetera, talking about the young people in contact with them. But you see, that's, that, that's uh, the radical event of Jesus Christ uh, in the very beginning, that God becomes man and then uh, is encountered. And, uh, and that's the point, is, is what did they see? What did, uh, what did John see? What did Andrew see? What did Simon see? What was the experience that goes on in them? And they, they spent the day with them. They listened to him. And they, were, they began to be changed interiorly, and they began to burn as a screamer burns. And, and we have to burn. And perhaps, you know, we have come to a point uh, in, uh, in this society, in this history of the world, uh, in the third millennium, which we have begun, and we're now 20 years into this millennium, uh, but still the, the fire, the, there, there are small fires, but it still is not ablaze. And uh, perhaps the virus is an encounter, is an occasion, an occasion for us to uh, notice. It's, it's like the Passover. It's, um, the Passover was destroying the firstborn of each family and the animals even. And the Jews were forced not into the temple, not to go to pray, not, to, not for us to go to the churches. Notice, it's no, you don't go to church, you go home. No, you don't go to the hospital, really, you go home. And at home, you have to find each other. You, ha you, have, to you have to come out of yourself. For some, uh, you have to learn how to cook a meal. Uh, and we don't really know how to do that, perhaps. Uh, but uh, you see, the, 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 something has to change which will bring us out of ourselves. And you too, me too. Because as time goes by, I brought this book of this encyclical of Pope Francis, but it, you know, it, what gets me is phrases, is, is paragraphs like uh, he, he says, and the biggest threat of all gradually take shape. He says, the gray pragmatism of the daily life of the church, or the daily life of the, of the city of New York, the daily life of South Orange, New Jersey, in which all appears to proceed normally, while in reality, faith is wearing down and degenerating into small-mindedness. A tomb cycle, we go through the motions, but we don't put ourselves into it. We're, we're not in it. We don't, we're not alive. We're not really awake. We're not listening. We're not being, permitting ourselves to be moved by the Spirit of God, who is fire. He's the fire of the, of the Father and the Son. 
uh, and then uh, Francis says, a tomb psychology thus develops uh, and slowly transforms Christians into mummies, which in a way we become. I mean, notice in the pew, uh, you know, we go through the motions. Of course, this happens to all men at all times doing the same things every time, every week, every day. And uh, you lose the poignancy, the fire of it. It's the, the, the self begins to turn back on itself and become accustomed to the, the situation and go through the motions. We check off the boxes. We go by the numbers. But we're not really present to it. We're not alive. We're not in love. Because the love is always active. It's always awake. It's present. It burns. It's, in fact, it can't live with itself. It has to look for the beloved, it has, and that's why I, I, I love the, the uh, that explanation. Is that um, the two of these, uh, the the uh, Manfredini and Giussani, they they you know they just can't contain themselves. They suddenly come to the realization that God has become man, and it lives an ordinary life in Nazareth. But this is God. This is the Creator. And how, then the question is, is, how does he live it? And what we have to do and what Escriva has pointed us to continuously is to go to the Gospels and, and read it, watch it, and take it to a half hour prayer in the morning and a half hour in the afternoon or more or less in, for everybody. Uh, and and uh, let, let the Spirit work in you. That's why I think uh, our Lord, Lord, you, you said... Uh, you said, uh, you know, if you find yourself at enmity with one of your brothers, go and make peace immediately so that uh, don't go to sleep on it. Don't go to bed on the anger because then the devil has a chance to work on you and begins to take the love out of your heart and you turn further and further to yourself. At any rate, what I wanted to get, a, uh, get, get to and is this, um, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but, but uh, what's I think extremely interesting and important uh, is uh, the effect of the, of the resurrection um, notice that the first encounters with the risen Christ <clears throat> in the flesh, they didn't recognize him. Now, Mary Magdalene uh, at the tomb, doesn't recognize him. And uh, she thinks that he's the gardener. And she says, Sir, if you have taken his body, tell me where you have placed it, and I will go and take it and bury it. And Jesus then, notice, she doesn't recognize him. And she thinks he's the gardener. So he says to her, now notice with this word, and this word carries the heart, the love, Mary. And she's stunned by the tone of the voice. Notice it's not just a paragraph of thought and ideas. It's not the numbers here. It's Mary. He calls her by her name. And she, in that, recognizes, in that voice, she recognizes the persona of Jesus Christ, the God-man. And she says, Ravoni. And she goes to embrace him, and he says, don't touch me until I ascend. So she didn't recognize him. And then uh, there were other, the other was the two Asad disciples on the road to Emmaus. They didn't recognize him either. So they were there at the crucifixion. They were followers of Jesus Christ. Uh, they are walking uh, along the road to Emmaus, and this stranger comes along with them and uh, asks them, uh, well, what are you talking about? What's your conversation? What are you talking about? And uh, they say to him, are you the only one here in Jerusalem that doesn't know the things that happened these days? And he says, what things? And they say, and, and, he's, and they say Jesus of Nazareth, who we had hopes in that would be uh, the Messiah, and uh, the solution to Israel. <clears throat> and so he begins to explain the whole Old Testament to them, piece by piece, as they walk along on this road to Emmaus. And they get to Emmaus, they get to the town, and they, he pretends to go on. And they say, wait, wait, stay with us, stay with us. 
and he pretends to go on, and they prevail on him. So the Lord, notice, he lets them prevail, and he goes in with them and sits with them, and they go in and they break bread. And in the breaking of the bread, which is the Eucharist, with him, uh, they recognize him. And then another scene is the uh, apostles, uh, after the resurrection, they're fishing, and uh, they f fish all night, they get nothing, and uh, he stands on the beach, they don't recognize him. They don't recognize him. Uh, these are the apostles. And uh, he says, boys, have you caught anything? And they say, no. So they fished all night. So he says, throw the net to the right. They obey. And they pull in 153 big fish from Lake Genezareth. And John, the, disciple, the apostle whom Jesus loves, particularly because the Lord has, notice he has gradations of his love. It's all love for all to death. But John, he has a particular affection for. John uh, says, it's the Lord. And uh, when Simon, who didn't recognize him, hears, it's the Lord, he leaps into the water with everything on and uh, drags, drags the net to the shore with the 153 fish. And when they get to the shore, they find that there's a fish already on the fire, and the Lord says, come, eat. Notice the warmth, the affection, the, the uh, friendship. And uh, the question is, is what, what goes on? I mean, why didn't they recognize him? Be and and the, answer is, the, the answer is that the, uh, the, the, the body of Christ, uh, what does Ratzinger say? He says, it's quite clear that after his resurrection, Christ did not go back to his previous earthly life. As we're told, the young men of, of Naim and Lazarus, they did. They died again. Those two, those two individuals were raised to life. Lazarus was raised and died again. The Lord, he rose again in definitive life which is no longer governed by the chemical and biological laws and therefore stands outside the possibility of death in the eternity conferred by love. That's why the encounters with him are, quote, appearances. They see him because he wills that they recognize him. In other words, you don't recognize the God in fleshed God unless he gives you the power to see and that comes from, and then is there's an encounter, like stay with us, or Mary says, Rabboni, or the John in the boat says, it's the Lord. So it comes down to something that has to take place in the person looking. There's a conversion that has to take place. There's a going out of self. There's a likeness that has to be achieved to the person, to the risen person of Christ in order to recognize him. Notice John the Baptist even. Notice the greatest of the prophets and the last um, uh, is in jail and sends out messengers to Christ. Are you really he who is to come or should we look for someone else? And the Lord says, tells the messengers, well, you go and tell John what you've seen and heard, that the lame speak, the lame walk, the dead are raised, the, the poor of the gospel preach to them, the deaf hear, and blessed is he who is not scandalized in me. So somehow John the Baptist, even at that late moment, there was still a scandal in him. He, he didn't, Ratzinger, I, the, let me take it from Ratzinger, the comment was uh, he had yet to go through another conversion. But John the Baptist had to go through another conversion himself in order to be able to recognize the risen Christ. And I say it to you that you and I have to go through a conversion again, 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 in order to be able to recognize Jesus Christ now. And perhaps this virus, this situation in which we're driven into our homes in order to find each other, but no, you can't go to work. No, you're not going to take the train. No, you're not going to get into crowds. I mean, I must say, Alex showed me, showed us the uh, uh, a photo of a guy going into a pharmacy with a, a scuba diving helmet on and and the, the, the regalia of the scuba diver uh, to be to, <laughs> you know to save himself from the virus. 
Uh, and so we're walking around with uh, bandanas on and uh, et, et cetera. But, uh, but you see, but the point is that, that uh, this, they, it's a real Passover that the, anybody out in the streets was killed uh, in the time of the Passover. And so they were all, they huddled at home and they didn't go to church, they huddled at home. It was, a, it was an encounter of person to person in the family, which is the, which is the, that you love one another as I have loved you, is following the commandment of the risen Christ. So um, that's the, the message that I have, at least for today, for this, that uh, the, the week that we're in is this. And the conversion that, uh, that we have to go through, and the last thing I would say, and I don't know if it's time, but let's say it's time, um, is that Our Lady, notice Our Lady was encounters in the fourth station, Our Lady encounters, comes to Jesus, and she, she notice she's there for the, for, the, for the three collapses, the falls, and she, I'm sure, at least it's in my, in my imagination, that she encourages him to get up and to continue, she's just at, as the marriage feast of Cana. She's she she's the one who announced. She's the one who reveals to to his human humanity that this is now the moment for the beginning of the public life. So uh, uh, get up and go, my son. And she, it's not Mary Magdalene. John Paul too. I remember. I was. I was not not shocked, but I was surprised to see this. Uh, that uh, he said at the resurrection um, that Our Lady was the first one to encounter. How he says, how could it be otherwise? He says, I'm, I'm speaking theologically here. He says, but this historically, it had to be this way. Christ is not going to reveal himself first to Mary Magdalene. He's going to reveal himself to Our Lady who gave him his humanity that now has just risen from the dead. I thank you, my God, for the good resolutions, affections, and inspiration which you have communicated to me in this meditation. I beg your help in putting them into effect. My Immaculate Mother, St. Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me.
The topic for our talk this evening is cheerfulness and spirit of service, which are, is obviously a topic that's particularly apropos for our circumstances uh, here and now. And as I was thinking about the topic, I was reminded of a short story by Willa Cather, a wonderful author. If you aren't familiar with her work, I'd certainly recommend it to you. A short story entitled Neighbor Rosicki. And it is about a farmer up in, uh, in the West. And one of the events in the story is a period of drought and it's followed by extraordinarily hot weather and a dry wind that is drying up all the crops. And all of his neighbors are depressed and angry and really upset by things. And Rosicki takes his farmer to what's left of their drying up swimming hole and they go for a swim and have a picnic and have a great time. And he, he says, there's no sense being upset or lamenting uh, things that we, we really just can't change. And that's his attitude throughout the story. He's a happy man. Now, perhaps uh, neighbor Rosicki, as far as we know, uh, was acting really just on kind of natural virtue, that he was a cheerful, optimistic man by temperament, perhaps had to work at it, but he was someone who made a practice of trying to see that the glass was half full rather than half empty. And that's something we can do too, right? We can try to focus on the good aspects of situations we watched a wonderful documentary here a few nights ago about a violinist who had been shut up in the, in the concentration camps of Hitler during the war, but who insisted on the fact that every situation has something good in it, that nothing is entirely bad. And again, in her case, that may have been largely just natural virtue, although she may have also derived some of it from her Jewish religion. I'm not sure about that. But again, it's an example we can try to follow in circumstances much less extreme than hers. We can also think about Saint Hirsch Maria. Uh, as many of you probably know, uh, during the Spanish Civil War, there was a very violent persecution of Catholics. About 7,000 priests and religious were murdered. And St. Jose Maria had to go into hiding. And during a period of months, he was hiding out in the consulate of Honduras, in a, basically living in a room about eight by 10, kind of the size of a very small bedroom with six other people. Uh, and they spent much of the day there, not the whole day, they went out to other rooms from time to time, but that was their base and that's where they slept. Uh, and the situation was extremely difficult. Not only was it very crowded, most of the other people unconnected with Opus Dei in the consulate were crabby, upset, angry at their situation, complaining a lot. Uh, of course, the situation was terribly crowded. Uh, the food was awful and very inadequate, so much so that when St. Hansa Maria's mother came once to visit, uh, she didn't even recognize him until she, he spoke and she heard his voice, but he had lost so much weight that she couldn't tell who he was. Uh, and in the midst of all of that, uh, he also was suffering from a deep interior trial. We don't really know and for certain exactly what it consisted in. We don't know the details. But apparently it was something like what the 
spiritual authors call the, the dark night of the soul, a sense of the absence of God, having to struggle to hold on to God and to his faith. And it was a, apparently a quite terrible trial. And yet, the people who were living with him 24 hours a day, crowded into that one little room, say that they never noticed that he was anything but completely upbeat and cheerful. Inside, he was suffering a great deal, but outside, he was happy, cheerful. And all of that is, I think, also related to what is the foundation of the spirit of Opus Dei, which is the sense of divine filiation, the sense of being a son of God, and therefore of having confidence in God. That God is my father, and he loves me, and he's omnipotent and omniscient. And therefore, everything that happens is somehow or other good. It may have bad aspects. It may be, from the human point of view, very trying or, or very bad. But deep down, it fits in somehow to God's plan for me. He either positively wishes it or at least allows it for my good. And so St. Josemaria was very fond of using a phrase from St. Paul where St. Paul says, for those who love God, all things work together unto good. Or in the Latin that St. Josemaria usually prayed it in, diligentibus deum omnia cooperanter in bonum. And he shortened that up even more to just the two word phrase, omnia in bonum, everything is for the good. And that was a phrase he prayed often and which helped him to maintain his good humor. And that's important. St. Josemaria often reminded us that people need to see smiling faces around them. We all need to see smiling faces around us. And right now, the members of your family need to see a smile on your face. Is perhaps the most simple and maybe the most important thing we can do to help the people around us, to keep smiling, to keep showing that we do have that interior happiness because we are children of God and God is our Father and he cares for us. The second aspect of this talk is about the spirit of service, about helping out. And now at least some of you have a lot more of that to do, perhaps helping your children with, with their homework. And it's not just homework now, it's their schoolwork. And you are suddenly converted uh, into teachers. The, a friend of mine has a group he put together that calls itself the involuntary homeschoolers. Uh, and some of you find yourself in that situation, which may involve quite a bit of extra work and service. Perhaps you face trying to keep the house neat with more than the usual number of people, and maybe one or more of them isn't all that neat and is leaving things around and uh, well, to keep on <laughs> picking them up and putting them in their right place so that the house is a pleasant place to live in so that it does look neat and orderly. Maybe you find yourself preparing lunch, uh, which in ordinary circumstances you wouldn't be doing, or doing the dishes, uh, doing laundry, and trying to do all these things with a smile. Okay? Perhaps singing even while you're doing some of them, but at least with a smile. You may find that some of the other people you're living with or you yourself have considerable cabin fever and edgy and uh, that may lead to uh, kind of negative comments or people overreacting to some minor thing that goes wrong or some minor comment that's made to them that they don't like. And 
And we may be tempted to kind of join in and, or to kind of tell them, hey, shape up, you know, it's really not that bad and so on and so forth. But in many cases, it's better to let things pass, to uh, try and change the subject, to avoid arguing or correcting on the spot. Huh? Maybe you want to wait a few hours, even a day or so, and then perhaps take the person aside, and again with a smile, but explain to them how their reaction in that situation really didn't help anything, didn't help others, and how much better it would be if they could try to behave a little bit better. Another thing I think we can do is try to think of things that other people would enjoy doing uh, that would make this a, a happy, cheerful time. Uh, maybe it's uh, putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Personally, I wouldn't enjoy that at all, but some people do. Uh, or maybe it's playing some board games, uh, classics like Monopoly or somewhat slightly more modern classic like Risk or some of the other board games. I think there's one out now about pandemics. I don't know if I would recommend that or not. Uh, uh, but maybe doing something like that, or maybe having a, a play reading, finding some short play on the web that your family would enjoy taking parts in and reading. Or maybe uh, reading a book out loud to, to other people or listening together to an audio book. Uh, one of the people here uh, at Southmont has just gotten a, a dramatized version of The Lord of the Rings that people might enjoy listening to. Or watching a, together a good movie or a documentary. Uh, we here recently saw Tom Hanks' It's a Wonderful Day in the Neighborhood. Really a marvelous film, very uplifting, I think, in many ways, uh, and much more complex than the title might suggest to you. Uh, there's also a great documentary uh, called It's You I Like uh, by John Paulson, who happens to be the brother of a very good friend of mine. Um, but it's also in itself a, a really excellent documentary. It's you I like. Or maybe you'd like to listen to some music together. Uh, or maybe watch a documentary like The Making of West Side Story, which I at least greatly enjoyed, uh, showing Leonard Bernstein rehearsing the orchestra for the concert version of West Side Story. Or, or maybe watching some of the episodes of Bernstein's Young People's Concerts, which are available on YouTube. Or you could even plan a trip to a different country uh, and look up some YouTube videos to uh, see the scenes there if you can't get there on the airplane these days. Or maybe you want to talk some about your, your family history, uh, things that have happened either in your immediate family, your wife and children, or maybe uh, your parents or your grandparents. Uh, so lots of things that, uh, that we can or could do, but to put some time and imagination into thinking about it. What would, uh, what would the other people here uh, enjoy? What would bring us together? What, what could we, yes, enjoy together? Well, I don't want to go on um, taking up too much time, but I think these two points of one, our own cheerfulness of trying to smile, trying to, trying to see the glass as half full, not just as a, I don't know, a psychological trick, but as a reflection of our faith, of our belief that we are sons of God and our Father God cares for us. And then the other thing of our trying to make this a good time for the others to look for ways that you and the members of your family who happen to be home now can, can enjoy yourselves together, can come closer together, uh, can perhaps come to, when this is all over, look back on it and say, hey, 
That was a good time. We had a good time. That would be a wonderful thing. So let me just uh, remind you then um, that uh, here at Southmont every Saturday we will be broadcasting a meditation at 7.30 in the morning. Uh, some Saturdays, it's not a really regular succession, but some Saturdays uh, there will be a class on the Catechism of the Catholic Church at 10 o'clock. Uh, we are, of course, having the, still having the monthly evenings of recollection. Uh, so we're trying to help uh, provide some content, some spiritual content for you during uh, these times. I'd also just like to say these are times to be concerned about other people. This talk has focused uh, pretty much exclusively on being concerned about the immediate people who are with you, who you're living with uh, these days, but also to be aware of the many other people who are suffering at this time, either because they're seriously sick or because others in their family are or because they have serious financial problems, and to look for ways that we can help them. Uh, we're... Uh, of course, as usual, going to ask for your financial help here for Southmont. But it's probably also a time to be especially aware of the needs uh, of your parish. You know, there, there's no Sunday collection uh, these days, so that's a very difficult thing for the parishes. Maybe to be concerned about individuals in need that you may know, somebody, uh, a friend, a relative, uh, a neighbor uh, who has lost their job altogether and they're not being paid and facing you know, very serious financial problems. Maybe you can help them in some way uh, or maybe more collectively through a food pantry or a group like Catholic Charities. Uh, we'll all be getting a $1,200 check in the mail or directly deposited in our bank from the U.S. government. Uh, for some of us, that's going to be a godsend, something that's really helpful and needed to meet immediate needs of the family. But for other people, it may be really a windfall, money that we don't particularly need, and maybe this would be a time to share that money. We hope you'll think of Southmont as one of the possible places, but many other possibilities that we can and should be helping. So that's the end of the talk here, and now we will go to the oratory where we will have the examination of conscience and a brief period of prayer following that, and then benediction to finish up. And again, I look forward to seeing you uh, in our little uh, virtual get-together after the recollection ends. For the moment, uh, we'll see you in the oratory. Act of the presence of God. Do I frequently consider the love Christ has shown us by taking our human nature and dying for us? Do I strive to correspond generously each day to his love? Do I try to get to know our Lord better and fall in love with him by reading and meditating on the Holy Gospel? Do I strive to imitate his life by my own? Do I deal personally with Jesus in my daily life and in the Holy Eucharist? Is Christ's sacred humanity the model for my own actions? Do I strive to imitate his virtues of friendship, sincerity, loyalty, daring, etc.? Do I try to imitate 
Jesus' hidden life of intense work. Am I overly worried about what others may think or say of me and thus make myself, take myself too seriously? Is the glory of God the principal reason for my actions or rather do I seek my own glory and ambitions? Do I try to be open and candid in my dealings with those around me? Do I shun any hypocrisy? Do I always want to have the final say in conversations and discussions, thinking that I am always right? Am I saddened when confronted by my own shortcomings? Or rather, do I go quickly to our Lord and ask for his grace to overcome them? Do I realize that the best way to become humble is to forget about myself and give myself to the others? Is my cheerfulness founded on my divine filiation? Do I allow difficulties at work or at home to rob me of my joy? Do I always look for the positive side in persons and events? Do I strive to create around me an atmosphere of joy, serenity, and understanding? Act of Contrition. Holy Mary, our hope, seed of wisdom, pray for us. So that finishes the day of recollection, but we hope you'll join us for an informal get-together now. And you can do that by going to the Southmont webpage, the part about the day of recollection, where you'll find a Zoom link. And if you do that in a minute or two, I'll join you for the get-together. Thanks very much for coming.